nearly three years after Unreal Engine 5 was revealed, we are just on the cusp of the first major releases using that engine. Immortals of Avium, Lords of the Fallen, Stalker 2, Heart of Chernobyl, and more should be coming out this year if all goes to plan. It's also been a while since we looked at the engine in any depth on the channel, and with the release of Unreal Engine 5.2, I think there's enough interesting talking points to make it worthwhile. So in today's video, I will be talking about what Unreal Engine 5.2 brings to the table, and what effect this might have on games that are coming out on it. Forget not, this engine is going to be powering a ridiculous amount of games this generation, as many developers like CD Projekt Red, Crystal Dynamics, and more who once developed their own tech have now switched to UE5 for future projects. So we're going to be seeing a lot of UE5. So what are some of those key points of interest in UE5.2? The cover story for sure is the procedural generation as showcased through the now released Electric Dreams demo on PC. If you recall the original showings of Unreal Engine 5 with Lumen in the Land of Nanite on PS5 and Valley of the Ancients on PC were made in a very particular way. Basically, artists would manually place and arrange each and every bit of the environment from prefabricated assets. This means spending time to copy and paste tons of them over and over again with slight rotations and scale changes to make those sparsely populated rocky environments in those demos. While it works well enough for those demos, such a large scale kit bashing, as it is called for such huge natural environments, is perhaps a bit impractical for real video game production. For one, there's a lot of manual labor, and two, it was a bit limiting on the engine side. All that overlapping of meshes meant hardware accelerated lumen, for example, was impractical, as its performance wouldn't be good. With the Matrix Awakens demo, Epic showcased a procedural tool to populate urban environments, and with 5.2 they've released another system for natural outdoor environments, like the one seen in the Electric Dreams demo, where now Nanite is also used not only for opaque objects like rocks, but it is also used for alpha mass transparencies for the leaves and trees and bushes found throughout the demo. Upon my first contact with the demo and in the editor itself, it is visually pretty powerful and makes convincing high quality environments from the limited number of assets. To give you a sense of what I mean, check out this environment here. Of everything you're seeing on screen here, only a very small portion of it has been manually made by an artist. If I toggle the procedurally placed assets off, I think you get a sense of the scope of what procedural generation means in UE 5.2. You can imagine there'd be a big positive effect here on 5.2 on game development, as it will be easier to populate large worlds and add a great level of detail now that more objects are done through Nanite, with the potential quality being much higher. And it doesn't just mean background objects like I was showing off earlier. Take for example this small riverbed area here where you could imagine a potential player walking around in this small clearing. This area was primarily defined with procedural generation and toggling those off we can see very little of it was actually placed in the traditional manner. You can really imagine the potential that this would have for large open world games in natural settings like The Witcher. Another positive side effect of this more systemic method of placement of assets is on the performance side where now you can actually use hardware lumen in these larger overlapping environments. In fact, at the default epic setting, it can run measurably better on GPUs. Depending on the shot, like this one here, we can see how hardware lumen can run nearly 14% better than software lumen at the exact same resolution while providing better reflection detail like we see in the shot here where the ray tracing and hardware lumen can resolve the individual leaves on the trees where software lumen sign distance field tracing leaves a lot to be desired with its bigger amorphous blobs in the reflections. You can see bigger differences in the quality between the two types of lumen in diffuse lighting quality where software lumen like we see on the left tends to over darken shadow regions as a byproduct of its inaccuracy. Shadowed regions with software lumen tend to be overly dark with little it'll bounce lighting at times. So with 5.2, we can see how hardware ray tracing can offer better visuals and better performance even at epic quality mode when GPU limited. This is definitely not the case with older methods of placing assets like found in the Valley of the Ancients demo, where hardware lumen was just unusable in spite of its potential higher quality. As I say that though, hardware lumen is still not an exact straight win under 5.2. When CPU limited, like we see here at this low resolution, we can see that software lumen offers a tangible 10% performance increase when CPU limited over hardware lumen. That's nothing to scoff at given how CPU limited this 
procedural generation sample is. If you'll notice, both sides on the performance graph here are just minimally above 60 FPS at times on a Core i9-12900K with 6400 megahertz DDR5. This is an area of the engine that I still think needs more work. It's CPU limitedness. When you just scroll around the game world here at a very high speed, we can see that CPU limitedness increasing substantially, where when you cross certain thresholds in the game map, frame times increase rapidly and get worse. The game essentially starts to stutter for a certain amount of time, and it disappears gradually until you recross another one of those boundaries in the game world again, and you'll see the same poor frame times popping up again. Much like when I covered Unreal Engine 5 the last time, it's still possible to see how the engine is not scaling in a great manner across many threads to increase performance. When going from 6 to 8 cores on a 12900K, CPU limited performance only increases by 6%. When turning on hyper-threading above that, it only runs 4% better than with 8 cores. And turning on an additional 8E cores on a 12900K brings 0% performance increase. That isn't great CPU scaling for what is going to be the premier engine driving games this generation. And it's especially concerning considering how CPUs are now getting much wider all the time with more cores and threads. And Unreal Engine 5 at the moment doesn't really noticeably use them in a way to increase performance. As a quick reminder, good performance scaling across all these threads and cores looks like this. In Cyberpunk 2077, we're going from four cores to the full 12900K season 88% performance increase. Each time you add more cores, it adds a great proportional percentage of performance. In the UE5 test, going from four cores to the 12900K sees a mere 30% performance increase, where increasing the amount of cores or threads given to the game gives very minimal performance increases, if any at all. Sure, there are more stable frame times when going from four to six cores, but beyond that, the differences are almost placebo territory by increasing the amount of cores you're giving the engine. So as I see it, UE5 still has a lot of room to take better advantage of modern multi-threaded processors. If you're on an Ada Lovelace GPU though, DLSS3 frame generation, as we can see here, does a lot to help this CPU limited situation out. And it was thankfully extremely easy to implement for me, an amateur user. It only took me about 11 clicks in total after finding the plugin on the Unreal Engine Marketplace. With DLSS 3 frame generation on, you can see a 97% FPS improvement under identical CPU limited scenarios. So you were seeing just about double the visual fluidity with DLSS 3 on. And I think it's a no brainer for any developer making an Unreal Engine 5 game to implement DLSS 3. The other key update found in Unreal Engine 5.2 that is going to be crucial for UE5 games in the future is an improvement to the shader compilation behavior in the engine on PC. As anyone knows who follows our coverage on PC, Unreal Engine can at times be called Stutter Engine. In UE4 and UE5.0, the only way to prevent shader compilation stutter was to set up a pre-compilation step before the game starts. This is done in a handful of UE4 titles, but requires a lot of manual work for the game developers, making them have to play through the game in a methodical way. If they miss some bit of content in that playthrough, well then, the pre-compilation sequence for shaders will be incomplete and the game would still have shader compilation stutter in it. With UE 5.1 and Fortnite's update, released around the time of 5.1's launch, Epic added asynchronous shader compilation, which worked in real time as you played the game, pre-compiling shaders in the background on the CPU, hopefully before you see them on screen. That was still work in progress and definitely not perfect. If a shader needed to be drawn but was still not pre-compiled asynchronously, the game would stutter, as we can see in Fortnite in its Chapter 4 update, which definitely had shader compilation stutter in it. With UE 5.2, they have made that asynchronous system more accurate and, also importantly, they added the ability for the developer to delay the shader display until it fully compiles, thus potentially eliminating all shader related stutter completely, but with the potential that a visual effect or a material might display a bit later than it otherwise could. To give you a sense of what that's like, here's me playing the Valley of the Ancient demo on a completely cold shader cache. 
When you play a game like this, as we're seeing here, anytime you do something new, like attack or cause an effect to show on screen, will show big stutters from a shader compilation. For example, when the massive golem lifts up in the cutscene, we see multiple stutters, with one being as high as 500 milliseconds. These ruin the experience completely. If I delete the shader cache from this run and have a completely cold shader cache again, we can see those same big massive game ruining stutters. Under this system, which is what many UE4 games had, you would only get a smooth gameplay experience by playing the same area twice. Now here's what the Valley of the Ancients demo is like while using the asynchronous shader pre-compiling and while turning on the new skip draw feature from 5.2. Now I'm showing you here a completely fresh cold shader cache and as everything we can see with those features on the game is running dramatically better. All of the larger stutter spikes when new effects are shown on screen are no longer there and there's no massive multiple spikes that occur when the golem wakes up of nearly 500 milliseconds. The game fluidity is dramatically improved with these new systems on, but I hope you notice there that the frame time graph is still not perfect, right? There are still stutters in there. For example, when moving the character around the environment, there are still a handful of 30 to 40 millisecond frame time spikes. And although there is no 500 millisecond frame time spike when the golem awakens, you can still see a few stutters there that reach around 50 milliseconds. If I compare this scene with a completely warm, perfect shader cache, as we see on the right here, versus the asynchronous caching system on the left, we can see that the asynchronous system does perform worse than a perfectly warm shader cache, and it does produce stutters that a perfectly warm shader cache does not have. Another reason why we still see stutters here is due to traversal stutter related to loading most likely. This is something UE4 has for sure, and UE5 has inherited it. As an example, loading up Fortnite's latest update which uses UE5.2. It no longer has really big shader compilation spikes like it did before, but while traversing the world you can definitely find totally random stutters in there, some of which are quite a lot larger than I would really like. So as a total, Unreal Engine is definitely less stuttery than it was before, thanks to features added in 5.2. But it still needs to work on traversal stutter, obviously, and I personally think its new asynchronous shader compiling system is not a silver bullet that devs can wholly rely on for a perfectly smooth player experience. For one, it doesn't appear to be on at all by default, which I imagine a number of devs will trip up on, not even realize, and ship games with big shader compilation issues. Secondly, as we saw when compared to a warm shader cache in the Valley of the Ancients demo, this new system can still produce stutters. As I see it, this new asynchronous system with skip draw should probably be combined with the older offline pre-caching system, and in tandem they would work better. You'd have pre-caching before the game starts for most shader combinations, and then the stragglers that it did not catch would be captured by the asynchronous system. This would then lead to presumably the best experience on PC. And with that being said, those are the two largest updates to Unreal Engine 5.2 that I think will have a big effect on games coming out on the engine in the near future. There have been some other smaller updates as well, but I think I will manage to cover those in the future at some point in time, or perhaps when the games come out. And until then, this is Alex saying, hit that like button, subscribe, ring that bell, hit us up on Patreon, and as always, this is Alex bidding you farewell and auf Wiedersehen.